It was a huge miscalculation on the part of India to think that there would be, there would be no response from Pakistan. My to Indian surprise, the very next day on February 27, Pakistan Air Force conducted six air strikes at different locations near Indian military installations in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, shot down two Indian fighter planes and captured the pilot. And since then, February 27 is being celebrated as a day of national pride. Why? On one hand, the day would go down in history as Pakistan's resounding victory over India Air Force. At the same, same time, the day also brought number of lessons with it as well. In his arrogance, Moody made a serious mistake of casting an evil eye on Pakistan, completely forgetting that Pakistan's armed forces were never ready, were ever ready to defend every inch of the motherland. As a result, India not only had to face humiliation from Pakistan Air Force, but its subsequent effort to cover its embarrassment in front of world community also further exposed the Indian designs and falsehoods. For Big 27 also proved that wars may be fought with weapons, but it is won by men with courage and conviction. Numerically, Pakistan armed forces may not be as large as Indian forces, but our men are ever ready to offer supreme sacrifice for the sake of Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, the post Pulwama incident also once again made it clear that any miscalculation could result in catastrophe for the region. In view of this, one can only hope that sanity will prevail and in future India will think many times before any misadventure against Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, may I add to your uh, information, two years back, on February 7, 29, 2020, India Study Center at Institute of Studies, Studies was established. And uh, since then onward, so far, we have had 31 events of national and international significance so on, roughly on every third week we had an event. And mostly we have been covering not only the uh, fault lines of South Asia, but Indian nefarious design in the region as well. And also Kashmir remains uh, a cornerstone of our discussion. With this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience hearing. I would like to request Director General, Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, Ambassador Azaz Ahmad Chaudhary for his welcome remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you. Uh, I wish thank you, uh, SAF and India Studies Center for organizing this. Uh, uh, it is uh, our privilege to welcome so many illustrious personalities representing nearly every war of Pakistani life. We have a representative from the parliament, chairman standing committee on, uh, senate standing committee on defense, and then we have a, a, a air force, Pakistan air force representation because it made us proud. Air, air Marshal Farad Hussain uh, is there. And then a, a diplomatic representation Ambassador Ziz Ahmed Khan, who was our High Commissioner to India also. And we have the academic input uh, from uh, Dr. Zwan Abbasi, and we'll also have the, the military input by General um, Asif Yasin. I think he'll be joining us shortly. Uh, we, ideally, we should have done it on 27th February, but it was Sunday. So uh, we were obliged to do it on a working day, which is today. Uh, and when we think of uh, this event, uh, we uh, obviously are uh, reminded of, uh, uh, of the intent and, uh, and, the, and the consequence. Now, when I look at India, 
Um, I think what India was trying to do was to set a new normal that it can engage in a conventional confrontation with Pakistan below the nuclear overhead. Now, it's known to everyone, everyone. But if you remember in 2016, September, it claimed that it has carried out a surgical strike, whereas it had not carried out. I think they were testing the waters. And in February 2019, they actually did that. And uh, 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 I think uh, they wanted to prove that if the United States can conduct surgical strikes on its own in various countries, why can't India do in this region? As luck would have it, Pakistan uh, happened to be better prepared and thanks to uh, Pakistan Air Force, which made us proud that day, and I personally also share that little pride because I was once part of Pakistan Air Force from 68th JDB. And, and uh, you know, our reaction was uh, both swift but also magnanimous. This gentleman who was sipping tea that day, he was returned, I think, within a day or two days? Three days. Three, three, two hours. 72 hours. That was a great <coughs> gesture, in my view by Pakistan. That means that Pakistan sent a message that we do not need to engage in this kind of provocation. It can be deadly, it can be dangerous. But I was a bit dismayed with the reaction of the international community. They did not really condemn India for uh, impeaching and in you know, breaching the sovereignty of Pakistan. I think they should have done that. <laughs> now, when I look at the changing global landscape, perhaps this is where the world is headed. No regard for UN Charter principles of sovereignty and respect for territorial integrity or non-intervention or non-interference or pacific settlement of dispute. No, I, I think they've all been jettisoned, all these principles. And the new normal is what the U.S. has done in so many of these countries, Iraq and Libya and Syria, and what Russia has done in, in Ukraine, and perhaps India also wanted to do that, that uh, to us. But Alhamdulillah, we have been fortunate that uh, we downed their planes, we mm -hmm. defeated their designs, and ever since, I think it has been, uh, in, I mean, I can say with considerable sense of satisfaction that deterrence was established because of this. So, uh, but we need to still, I think, uh, think through what are the long-term, short-term, medium-term and long-term implications of what happened that day. And that's why we have these perspectives from, uh, uh, from people's representatives, from diplomat, diplomats, from academia, from um, Pakistan Army and above all from Pakistan Air Force. So we are very grateful to you and grateful also to those who are here uh, for joining us in, in expressing our sense of satisfaction for what Pakistan did, that's it, but also to study and understand what its long-term implications are for the peace in South Asia. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a distinguished panel of speakers with us today. Our first speaker is Air Marshal Farhat Hussain Khan, Lala India's military. Air Marshal Farhat Hussain Khan was commissioned in GDP branch of Pakistan Air Force in March 1977. During his service, he remained on various important command and staff appointments. He is a recipient of Sitara India's military, Lala India's military, and Sitara Basadat. In September 2021, Air Marshal Farad Hussain Khan took over as President, Center for Aerospace and Security Studies. He will be sharing his views on Operation Swift Retort and future challenges for Pakistan Air Force.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ambassador Khalid, Mahmoud, Chairman, Board of Directors, Khair Basar, Ambassador Azaz, Ahmed Chaudhary, Director General, Khair Basar, Senator Basayel Saint Shagar, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. I am really thankful to the management of IWSI for inviting me today to talk on a subject very important to our national security, as already covered. In my next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I will be talking specifically about the Operation Swift Retard and future challenges for Pakistan Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, the events of February 2019 almost rocked the strategic stability of South Asia, of two neighboring nuclear powers. With the two air forces challenging each other's abilities in various spectrums. After the events of 14th February 2019, despite all assurances by the government of Pakistan for conducting an independent inquiry and also warning of swift response to any misadventure, India opted to carry out a night air strike against an alleged terror camp in Balakot, deep inside satellites. First ever attempt of that time. This was a major act of war as per our national security paradigm. This demanded a matching response. Therefore, government of Pakistan tasked Pakistan Air Force to respond by carrying out a punitive strike. I plan to present the subject in the following sequence. Let me just highlight a few basic principles that figure out prominently in any small or big conflict. And it's the case here also. That is called principle of war. First and the foremost, aims and objectives. This forms the most essential part of any mission. Second, is offensive action. Remember, offense is the best defense, even conducting defensive operations. Maintenance of morale. It is so essential for a country to go into war with high morale and the armed forces as well. Surprise. Achieving surprise means half the battle is won. These are some of the principles, otherwise there is a long list of the principles that I do not need to touch at this stage. And now, some of the characteristics of the air power, as to why was the air power used for this role. First, the height. In the air, all direction go everywhere. There is no resistance. So there is a total freedom of action with the command. Second, the speed. It enables drastic reduction in reaction time and helps create surprise. Third, the reach. A combination of speed and height enhances the ability to take the battle deeper and wider. 
creating complexities for the animal. Flexibility. All multi-role aircraft of today can carry variety of missions and can also change roles within the missions. Responsiveness. It means the ability to rapidly deploy and redeploy to concentrate in a particular domain. The concentration of force, it is the ability to concentrate firepower to meet time and space matrix. That is to say, if the firepower is to be concentrated on a time, then all directions focus to that place. If it is time, then you can have different targets at the same time. So it is a tremendous characteristic available to the aircraft. Before going into the February conflict, it is essential to study the environment that existed at that time. First, Kashmir, an unfinished agenda of partition, continues to be a major factor of strained relations between India and Pakistan. Both India and Pakistan became declared nuclear powers in 1999. Therefore, the nuclearization that took place in 1999 would always be a factor in any serious security situation between the two countries. With Modi elect BJP coming to power in 2014, RSS agenda has been dominating policy formulation in India, particularly when it comes to Kashmir and minorities. Having signed various mutual and multilateral agreements, the August Quad, Quad 20, part of Nuclear Supply Group, BACA, etc., India and US relations, particularly in the field of defense, continues to grow at a faster track. Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States, issued formally by the United States, has officially defined a regional hegemonic role for India. Strategic and diplomatic balance as also touched by uh, an honorable host, around the world, particularly in the Middle East, Asia Pacific, South Asia is certainly turning pro-India. It is in this background that India conducted false flag operations against Pakistan. And now, analysis of the IF strike. After 14th February incident, Indian leadership started creating hysteria and blamed Pakistan for the attack. Despite, like I said earlier, all assurances by the government of Pakistan, its political military leadership of an Indian independent inquiry, she opted for a false flag operations. And on 26 January 2019, launched an aerial attack on Balakot. I will now go through the detailed analysis of the strike. First, the planning. The aims, as I defined earlier, very important factor in planning. Political aims of the Indian strike, as per the new political norms, as also touched upon by uh, Ambassador Azaz, was to establish hegemony and demoralize Pakistan. Had this success been successful, <coughs> it would be a different situation altogether. Military aim was to break the credibility of Pakistan's strategy of credible deterrence. With these two objectives, there were two riders that defined 
by the government of Pakistan for the Indian Air Force. First, after personal <coughs> delivery, the aircraft must return as fast as possible. This was a dictate of the government. Second, no losses of the Indian aircraft were acceptable. All this means is our defensive mindset. That is not how the air power is deployed. Selection of target. <coughs> An analyst from India, I like to quote, they debated two targets, Balakot and Bahalkot. Supposedly, their, uh, in their language, the camps. But Balakot was selected. Why? Because Bahalkot had very close Pakistan Air Force bases. They thought it would be difficult to get out of that region after the strike. In case of Balakot, it's the closest Air Force, uh, Air Force base is about 100 kilometers. So even an aircraft which is only airborne will take 10 minutes to reach. So that was the difference between two. So that's how they selected that. Now the timings of the strike. A bright moonlit night was preferred over dark and day strike. Reason being, night, when you conduct a night strike, you create complexities for the defenders. And increase problems for the air defenses. Although there are complexities of conducting the strike as well. I will analyze this factor subsequently also. Saturation of defenses. Normally speaking, all air power commanders before employing the air power would like to see the state of defenses and try and saturate those so that the damages by the interceptors or the ground defenses are as less as possible. What the Indian did was only one step, that is to create false target traps. We call it STGs, spurious target were generated by flying a different formation a bit south of, uh, towards the south, so they could disperse the available effort to two sides. The package consisted of about 20 Garage 2000s, equipped with Spice 2000 and Israeli standoff, electro-guided, EO-guided, I'd like to re-emphasize, they selected a weapon of normal camera at night, a basic mistake in the planning. Although a guided weapon, but needs guidance. Mirage is a very potent platform. It's a multi-role fighter which can carry all kind of loads, including BVR missiles. So the package that they had, they were strikers, they were escorts and fighter sweeps carrying BVR missiles. Technically a very, very potent threat of 20 high-tech aircraft. <coughs> now, analysis of all this. IAF had the initiative, because they could choose any day, they could choose any time. Secrecy, and above all, surprise. Aggressors has this option. So they had all these factors that I talked in the characters of air power in their favor. The entire, if I am allowed to say, tactical environment suited them. Despite having a potent package of high-tech aircraft, 
I have failed to engage any worthwhile target. Reason? I'll talk later. And drop Jackson's bombs in general. Why? The planning was flawed. The flaws in the planning were basically a defensive frame of mind where riders were more important than objectives. It doesn't go in the air warfare. Well. Second, the aims did not match with our national will and ability to contest. They underestimated the adversaries. Target selection. Target selection was not very good. Knowing well, in the hilly areas, it is not an even ground. And to have an even ground is better, the weapons can be more accurate uh, on, on planes than hilly areas because of the ridges and then the uneven terrain there. In uneven terrain, sometimes you drop a bomb 50 feet short, it may go down 1000 feet down. So the, the selection of target had this flaw. Then, like I talked earlier, they selected electro-optic oblique laser guided bombs. Now at night or day whatever the time is, the weapon has to be guided to the target. The target has to be seen. They did not even cater for the weather. So there are clouds in that area. And from the clouds you cannot see through the cameras. So there were false targeting took place. So therefore, they drawn the bomb elsewhere. And, and, and one more technical thing, the information fed into the aircraft system about the terrain was wrong. Incidentally, this mistake is not due new to the Indian Air Force. They did that in Kargil also. PF BDR force multiplier cap capability was not even catered for it. Lacked the overall package, lacked force multipliers. When I say force multipliers, means some jammers to quieten the enemy defenses, the radars, the aircraft sensors. There was no such disruption on Pakistani Air Force, airborne or ground radars. Riders by the government restricted the free freedom of action for the formation leaders. The back of their mind was, the mind pilots must go back safe. I must not stay here for more than required, I must run back. This was in the back of the mind. And above all, Mr. Modi's statement that if they had Rafal, the situation would have been different. A similar views were also expressed by the Indian Air Chief. Now what does it mean? All it means is their political, milit political military leadership does not have trust on their own Air Force, which calls itself fourth largest Air Force of the world. They have to wait for 36 Rafals to take a breather. Despite all high-tech weapons that they had in terms of SU-30s, Rajas, Metro 9s they were not confident of their Air Force. So therefore, the results were obvious. Overall, it was an aimless, <coughs> purposeless strike where the IF 
fail to achieve political, that is creating fear and hegemony, as well as military, that means damage on ground to the fact of deterrence. Both these objectives could not be achieved. It was a typical example of how not to employ air power. Defensive minds cannot apply air power effectively. I allow me to make another statement. IF calls itself the fourth largest air force in the world. And Technically, as a professional, I would like to respect that. However, I would like to highlight that yes, Indian Air Force has a size, but it's not larger than its size. Now I come to the shift retort and the PF challenge, challenge that the PF faces. Prior to IF strike, a very clear national will for appropriate response was conveyed to the entire world. We exactly knew what was to be done. A quid pro strategy was to be followed. Agar aap ye samajhte hain ki aap Pakistan ke upar kuch kisi kisam ka hamla karenge, Pakistan retaliate karne ka sochega nahi. Pakistan retaliate karega. Similarly, after this statement, details were left to the air chief to decide. He responded with an equal determination. After the strike, our command stayed cool. Revisited the plans already prepared and practiced. Warned the enemy to be ready for a response. The response will come. Can be point and time of our choosing. And this. Uh, PF responded within 30 minutes and mindful of controlling the escalation ladder. The package okay. The package was supported by BVR and short range missile to fighter sweeps and escorts. A pre militia electronic order of battle, which is all pictures of the entire sensors were made available. Electronic countermeasures and counter countermeasures were all there. Airborne early warning and control system looking to 250 miles inside the Indian territory were available <coughs> in the air. There was a complete radio silence. All messages were passed to each other and to the command center on data link. Just short of weapon delivery, targeting shifted from military command center to a few feet away. Please look at this slide. This is the actual target. And he's still picture the value of that. If you can. Okay, just just hold it. It's leveling. Okay. The idea was to show the target was locked on, tracked, pictured, and then targeting was shifted to another place because the direction was that you must not allow the situation to escalate further. My analysis of the PF strike, I'll try and accelerate. We achieved both 
political and military objectives. Trade trends stood re-established. It was a calibrated, proportionate, deliberate, and most importantly, a graduated response to prevent escalation. PF shot down two aircraft, one Victor one and one S-30, as already talked by uh, Zasa, and also uh, a helicopter uh, was downed by their own defenses with six people on board. And Pakistan Air Force established ascendancy over a much larger Air Force. Another four to five, this point to note, four to five aircraft were available on the screen to be shot. But that would have escalated the war. So the pilots exercise restraint. This can only be done by well-trained disciplined force. Overall, it was a textbook example of successful planning and execution of a complicated mission where a disciplined and well-trained military instrument achieved all its political as well as military objectives. It was singled out, uh, if I was to single out a factor, it was unity of political military command, PF's superior planning and training methodology and when to fight. Let me say, the training matters. More we certain peace, less we bleed in war. Or after achieving this victory, we do have a lot of challenges. More so in the new geopolitical order. And I will only touch upon four challenges that we have faced today. We have to stay abreast with the technological development to maintain our own baseline of efficiency. Nine, non-kinetic means of strengthening the war fighting has to be kept in mind. Like space, cyber, these are new battlefields that are coming up. In the new regional order, acquisition of technologies could be challenging. Therefore, aggressive indigenization strategy is of the core technologies is the recommended way forward. Budget constraints in our staggering economy could become challenging for building aviation industry. Therefore, public-private partnership may be developed to encourage private sector participation in defense technologies. Now the conclusions, speed, flexibility, and responsiveness the basic characteristics of air power made the air power as an instrument of choice by both sides for achieving political military objectives. India failed to achieve the political as well as military objectives, whereas Pakistan, through crude probe response, achieved both political and military objectives and ensured credibility of military deterrence. Furthermore, Things do not stop at sit, stop and trot. PF and indeed the entire nation needs to stay prepared to counter such an adventurism posing serious challenges to our security. World community was almost muted and in fact at the hindsight supportive of the Indian depression. Let us not hope for anything better in new regional order. It is an unfortunate reality that needs to be acknowledged and to be prepared to handle serious challenges to on our own. No help should be expected. A new world order. India has an influential role in US decision making regarding South Asia, throwing serious challenges to our acquisition of Western technologies. In an otherwise technology dependent PF. Therefore, a resilient indigenous strategy for core technologies is the way forward. With that, I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, what PF did 
was expected out of a committed paid air force. As per the vision of a guy that he said in 1948, a country without a strong air force is at the mercy of any aggressor. Pakistan must build up our air force as quickly as possible. It must be an efficient air force, second to none. I thank you all. Dr. Abbasi is Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations at National University of Modern Languages, Islamabad. She received her PhD from the University of Western State, specializing in international security and nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, non she has authored a book titled Pakistan and the New Nuclear Threat Book, Regional Deterrence and the International Arms Control Regime. She will be sharing her thoughts on Balakot crisis and strategic stability in South Asia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, <coughs> Ambassador Khalid Mohamed Saab, um, Ambassador Rizal Chaudhary, um, Dr. Safar Rahman, mm -hmm. Senator Mishaib Hussain Sahib, General Yaseen, uh, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. First of all, of course, I'm grateful to Area Studies Center for giving me this opportunity to share my academic views on this important location. I think first of all, I would like to extend thank you and thanks to Air Marshal Sahib for um, enlightening us on highly technical aspects of this particular episode. Of course, I will be presenting very brief academic views from my part. We all understand that the eruption of Pulwama Malakot crisis clearly has set new patterns of engagement between India and Pakistan. This misadventure was laced with the dangerous escalatory risks that carried the potential to have swiftly breached nuclear threshold. This event has posed renewed challenges to regional strategic stability. If not managed bilaterally, and I view such future crises can lead the two sides into mischaracterization, misperception, and accidents leading to nuclear exchange, given the two sites' geographical proximity and time factor involved. Balakur strikes represented a classical example of stability-instability paradox, the notion that two states uh, with nuclear weapons can be more likely to engage in small-scale conflicts because each side knows that the other does not want to risk a wider escalation uh, or war given nuclear risks, they can feel more confident engaging in smaller provocations, aggression, and assault. In case of Balakot, India misleadingly assumed that it can defy the cred credibility of Pakistan's deterrence for, deterrent force, thus questioning its national resolve. Yet, credible minimum deterrence in my view was held at the strategic level. It was not a failure of deterrence as none of Pakistan's red lines, as generally understood, were crossed. De-escalation happened. Both the states somewhat behaved rationally while exhibiting restraint. The dogfight was played out in a measured and controlled manner, thus keeping the scale of violence limited, leading to de-escalation due to fear of use of nuclear weapons. However, in the backdrop of full spectrum deterrence, I as a claim, confusion in some quarter persists on failure of nuclear deterrence. I believe that we should avoid raising public expectations of total immunity to even any small breach. And we should, uh, I would say, uh, breaches are bound to occur, but deterrence holds. Yet claim of total invisibility might lead to lowering of morale when such breaches occur. So the Indian brinkmanship during the, uh, I would say, Balakur crisis is reminiscent of the US and Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. The US and Soviet Union, um, of course, experienced 
similar crisis, but always step back from the brink. We should understand that similar event such as invasion of Hungary did occur during the Cold War. Russia can be relatively confident that the US and its allies won't come to Ukraine, well, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ukraine's defense directly, because such a uh, you know, clash carries the threat of nuclear war. This sense made uh, Russian President Putin more confident that this uh, I mean, invasion would succeed. It is worth noting that the two states, dire uh, you know, direct territories are not involved in these instances, whereas in the case of India and Pakistan, I believe, geographical contiguity is a serious escalatory factor. Mm -hmm. So during Balakur crisis, Indian threat of launching Brahmos missiles to gauge targets in Pakistani territory was highly escalatory, thus leading to create false positive or false negative escalation risks. Pre and post launching ambiguity persists between India and Pakistan too. There is no distinction between nuclear and conventional delivery systems. So in my view, mischaracterization, ambiguity, and un uncertainty prior to launch did persist throughout the Cold War period. This risk is also attached to uh, South Asia, even uh, at present. So more so, the Balakut event has highlighted the evolving leadership crisis in India. Without realizing how could PM Modi approach the brink of nuclear catastrophe or pull back in time if crisis escalated, Modi ordered launch of surgical strikes, thus compelling Pakistan for a bigger conventional response. Indulged in nuclear cyber rattling as PM Modi's threat of the night of murder was not only just highly emotional and irrational practical move, but it also generated serious doubts regarding validity of Indian no first use doctrinal commitments, a concern which Pakistan has always underscored. More so, mobilization of Indian nuclear submarine during the Balakot crisis also directs questions to the Indian no first use policy. So US tacit approval for India to launch surgical strikes has generated new risks between the two nuclear rivals. Thus, I would say that this event clearly signaled diminished direct role of US as a crisis manager from South Asia. This in turn may create space for Russia or China to play a key role as mediator in this particular region. This episode also called into question the utility of bilateral crisis management channels such as military to military, political to political, DTMOs or FS level hotlines. So strategic communication in my view should be done through direct and formal communication channels which were not operational during Balakot crisis. So sensational role uh, was played by Indian media, thus generating war frenzy and mobilizing BJP government towards risky surgical strikes. Unlike Pakistan, domestic politics has always been a significant factor in Indian nuclear policy. So more so, not only Modi campaign on, the, on his handling of the crisis and his uh, willingness to commit a night of murder, he also promised to strip Kashmir of its semi-autonomous status. And he has now taken that step, prompting what may uh, you know, begin yet another cycle of violence in South Asia, thus creating more space for false flags operation. So it goes without saying that any Indian misadventure in the future cannot be ruled out, especially after Indian acquisition of Rafael and S-400. Pakistan is compelled to strengthen its conventional deterrence um, to prevent the lowering of its nuclear threshold. We should also hold no doubt about our resolve to whatever it takes to deter India and safeguard our national sovereignty and national security. Recently, um, uh, uh, we have seen you know, developments in Ukraine. Uh, such kind of patterns also highlight the continued relevance of nuclear deterrence, but in parallel, conventional deterrence has become further relevant if states end to fight and de-escalate under the nuclear overhang. Thus, I would say finally that urgent serious focus on risk reduction measures is required. Some risk reduction measures can include reactivating dialogue, rehabilitating strategic communication channels, introducing code of conduct 
on use of media during crisis. This trained my ears against the development of destabilizing systems which could seriously impact crisis and arms control stability and initiate talks between both sides to clarify the nature of different missiles as which one are conventional and which one are assigned uh, you know, with strategic role. Finally, I would argue that both sides should learn lessons from Balakot and implement measures to avoid such misadventures, thus evading misperception, accidents, and inadvertent escalations. So with this note, um, I would like to thank you for your patience and attention. joined the Pakistan Army in 1973. His last assignment was the command of 11 Corps, spearheading the stabilizing operations in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region. He was appointed as Secretary of Defense in July 2012 till 2014. He will enlighten us on false flag operations, a threat to peace in South Asia. the intent of deceiving the public 
or the target audience with regards to the perpetrators of the false flag. These operations could be a solitary happening or a succession of deceptive episodes towards materializing a long-term strategy. With a visualized plot to fabricate and falsely accuse or allege other governments to justify aggression or a military action against them. A number of these pseudo-operations have been conducted in the past and few of them I would just uh, elaborate. Uh, one was Operation Himmler by Hitler in which uh, massacre was carried out uh, by the Jews of the Germans to create a pretext to punish the Jews. Another was Operation Northwood by the United States. In this operation, the people were targeted, the American public was supposed to be targeted and killed in the United States with a pretext to attack Russia. Those people were supposed to be Russian agents. And this culminated in the famous Bay of Pigs crisis in Cuba. So that was also a false flag. The Levon affair, which the Israelis conducted in Egypt, in this operation, some Egyptian Jews were hired to, uh, to attack American and British interests in 1954 to, 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 to uh, entice the British and the Americans to you know, bring in forces. And in the, in, it was in the, in the wake of the Suez Canal crisis. And uh, it was basically to, to continue to hold Suez Canal, which Nasser wanted to uh, take over and nationalize. I, this is my personal view, based on my analysis, 9-11 was the biggest false flag operation ever conducted in the history of mankind. There is no proof that Al-Qaeda undertook this operation. So my view is it was an, a false flag operation for the American military to go and do something around the world and very, very, you know, very suitably they, uh, they attacked Afghanistan. And why Afghanistan? As Alama Iqbal called, it is heart of Asia. So the Americans jumped into the heart of Asia. What happened with them is a separate story. So this is all about false flag operations. Now we come to the India-Pakistan situation. These operations were staged by so-called Tamil separatist or Royal Nepalese group in 1960 in India or killing or rape of Bengalis by Indian soldiers wearing Pakistani military uniforms. This was also a false flag operation. In Mumbai, everybody knows Taj Hotel or soldiers in Pulwama. These were the major false flag operations in India-Pakistan uh, backdrop. India is effectuating its vitriolic and contemptuous campaign by constructing a narrative declaring Pakistan a hotbed of violence and terrorism in the region. To serve the same, its far-right political parties and opposing forces established a perception of common or fictitious adversary to unite its culturally despondent populace. The Indian election has, was all based on a Pakistan, anti-Pakistan narrative. And this narrative is part of the, the genesis of false flag in the present environment. <clears throat> now major recent events. On 20th March 2000, the day of bloodshed, mass killing of around 35 Sikhs took place in Anantana, district of Indian occupied Kashmir. Initially, lashkar e taiba and Pakistan were accused of this. The Indian parliament was attacked in 2001. India also referred it to lashkar e taiba and jaish e Muhammad. Another false flag, a false flag operation was exposed by their own media and it was in the pre-election in the subterfuge of Obama attack. The war frenzy of Indian media can be gauged from the fact that whenever terrorist attacks take place in India, even before the investigation starts, they start blaming Pakistan. If you recollect the Taj Hotel incident, within three hours, there was a claim that Pakistan has undertaken. The operation was still ongoing and the Indian media and the Indian government raised the false flag that Pakistan is behind it. 
The media has never been able to ask its government when the BJP was in power from 98 to 2004. During the 10 years of Congress rule from 2004 to 14, there was only one major attack, while in the in case of BJP, there have been 19 major attacks in occupied Kashmir in five years. False flag operations of future between India and Pakistan. Post Kargil, India has not been able to have a viable excuse to initiate hostilities against Pakistan and is not likely to have anything in the future too. Consequently, false flag operation is the only option available to undertake offensive kinetic operations against Pakistan and Balakot is a case in point. <coughs> this has also been seen in the change environment, backdrop of change environment in Afghanistan from where a massive terrorism campaign was being undertaken in connivance with major Western intelligence agencies. Now, as that option has also been drastically limited, if not totally stopped, the Indians would resort to create an instability in Pakistan to keeping the LOC and eastern border hot. For such a design, they are only left with one operation, one option, and that is false flag from the east. Regional peace. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to regional peace, any conflict between India and Pakistan, both nuclear armed countries, would spell a definite disaster for the region, if not for the globe. Since such a conflict would surely be the consequence of Indian false flag operation, which, if not managed adroitly, would become the trigger of a regional conflict or even a nuclear war. Therefore, to obviate such an eventuality, both India and Pakistan have obligations. First, India must stop contemplating a military op uh, option to subjugate Pakistan, failing which it will resort to false flag operations to initiate and justify hostilities. These hostilities may be initiated by India, but would be concluded as and when Pakistan would decide. As the Prime Minister once said, India can start a war, we will finish the war. As far as Pakistan is concerned, it has threefold responsibility. First, Pakistan must continuously monitor Indian policies and identify its directions, particularly when leading towards a conflict scenario. It should keep wargaming such eventuality of such possibilities to identify as false flag and structure a response. <coughs> Secondly, it must not allow instruments and elements to have freedom to facilitate any such Indian design false flag, flag operation. For this, all such elements must be kept under closed board and not allowed any space operate in Pakistan or abroad. Third measure is the post-occurrence analysis and response generation accordingly. This is the most critical as, as, the, as by this time we would have reached a critical stage with minimum or no time to switch responses. That I want to explain that once a false flag, for example, Balakot had taken place. If we were not conscious of what was happening, it could have generated into a wider sort of conflict. As the air marshal brought out, they had a, you know, a false uh, appearance on the border. We did not respond to, respond to that. If we had responded to that, I think a greater conflict would have taken place. And remember, the planning of any conflict in the military, as we say, finishes after the first bullet is fired. Then consequences and the events take over and it's very difficult to control it. <coughs> also by now, our miscalculation was result in the success of Indian design and conflagration of the incident into a full-fledged conflict, not only impinging on our sovereignty, but also threatening the conflict to spread, causing a regional instability. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be prepared for always meeting the challenge of false flag operations. 
whereas India will not venture to initiate an all-out war against Pakistan due to our conventional preparation as well as presence of a strategic deterrence. Yet it may undertake false flag operations to trigger a localized conflict. It could be for national reasons or for very narrow political reasons of that party. Come elections, who knows, they may create another action like that. It is therefore imperative that Pakistan not only prepares well in advance for such eventualities, but also warns India as well as the international community about a swift, powerful and type of response and place and time of its choosing. Thank you very much. joined the Pakistan Foreign Service in 1969. He had a distinguished career as he served as Pakistan's ambassador to Afghanistan and High Commissioner to Malaysia and New Delhi. He will be speaking on post Palakot trends and tra trajectory of India-Pakistan relations. took place 
and resolve the issue peacefully. This was uh, soon after this uh, meeting was over between the two defense secretaries, Rajiv Gandhi visited Pakistan. And Alisa would remember that because we were together at that particular occasion, that the press statement that was issued, towards which again he worked the whole night with it, the Indian counterpart, to finalize that press uh, statement, the the, the, the two prime ministers endorsed, there were two, two paragraphs in that statement, endorsing the agreement reached and asking for full implementation. The Indian military immediately started uh, interfering with that, and till today that issue remains, and it has been not resolved because of the intransigence uh, of the Indian military. We have the eight-point program. Once again, we started uh, discussing a multi-track discussion in which progress was made in every area except, of course, the Kashmir issue. And we were almost at the verge of agreeing to all, all, all the issues that were being discussed. Then, again, it was the Indian side which reneged imposed difficult conditions, even for Siachen, and Sir Creek and so on. I mean, I remember I even once uh, at, uh, at a, uh, discussed it with the Indian Army Chief, General J.J. Singh, and he says, no, why do you agree to what we are asking for, and only then we move forward. This has been a pattern as far as India is concerned. Uh, they are just not, I have come to it the conclusion after having spent a lot of time having dealt with India, starting with 85 when, uh, when I was posted as DCM in Delhi, that I have been observing the trajectory of our relationship. And the problem has been always that India reaches up to a certain point and then they want a little more. And then they want a little more. Recently, again, there is talk and uh, to about uh, improving relations, and uh, I think statements have been made at even at the senior official level here that Pakistan should resume trade relations with India and it will be beneficial for Pakistan. Of course, all trade relations are always beneficial. But then quoting World Bank figures of that the possibility of a 35 billion or uh, uh, 37 billion, I don't re remember the exact figure, uh, but it's around, uh, around this, that is the potential of Pakistan-India uh, trade relations. We have had trade relations with, uh, India and pa uh, between India and Pakistan when the uh, eight-point program was going on, dialogue was going on. Uh, the trade was around 2.5 or 3, 3 billion. It is, it is not, perhaps after a, a couple of decades or so, that the level will be reached to that. But more than that, uh, more than that it, the potential is not there. I think we, those figures are exaggerated. But not contesting that, again, we need to, we need to see how we can move forward in these areas. And here I personally feel, and now this is uh, uh, a purely personal uh, uh, opinion, that the possibility of forward movement between India and Pakistan is, does not exist at all. I may be, I may be uh, taking a very pessimistic point of view, but the fact of the matter is that with the present dispensation, which is in Delhi, it is Im almost impossible to move forward. They are going to, uh, and you have, you have seen what they have done in Kashmir. It is against UN resolution, it's against international law, it is against, the action is against the Indian constitution and as well as the similar agreement that they have signed with Pakistan and which they 
keep talking about endlessly. But they went ahead and knew it. What they are doing with the Muslim population of India is almost like genocide. And nobody is uh, raising a voice internationally except for Pakistan. Uh, and and, and uh, they are being emboldened by that. So under these circumstances, and also the elections are going to take place next year. Well, very important UP elections are already there. Let us see what happens at UP. And if BJP gets a setback in UP, I personally feel that India will go ballistic as far as Pakistan is concerned. They are going to talk viciously and they are, as Jenisa pointed out, probably create a false flag operation in order to divert attention from what, uh, what is happening in India. And that possibility will always remain. So let us not get starry-eyed about forward movements. I personally feel very pessimistic about the trajectory of our relations post Balakot. Like we will, we should brace ourselves and be very vigilant that something like Balakot is likely to happen. Or, it, or even sometimes if it doesn't happen, they will be making claims uh, about it. They, 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 I mean, all countries have various factors that affect their foreign relations. But in case of India, Bollywood also plays a factor where they think about those uh, heroics that actually they are not capable of doing and they don't have. So India, but here, in order to keep tensions high, they will do something uh, stupid. And I personally feel, feel that at this stage, we should be very clear in our message to India. We should not be uh, talking about trade and so on and these things, although they are important. A clear message that the only issue between Pakistan and India is the Kashmir issue. And so long as that is not resolved, to the satisfaction of Kashmir, we have offered several formulas. The four point formula was a, a, a very good effort of a large CBM so that conditions may be created in order to move forward. But it again didn't work. And it was India which was recalcitrant about uh, doing that. So uh, moving forward. This pattern has been, I mean, at least I personally have uh, observed this pattern. We have, we have been optimistic and then we have uh, been disappointed. So now, let's just hold our horses. Let's not talk about great possibilities of uh, you know, money coming Pakistan's way because of trade relations and so on. Let us just concentrate on only one issue. That is uh, the, the, the resolution of Kashmir issue. And so long as that does not happen, let's keep quiet and let's Hold our, hold our horses. Because I personally feel, and having been for myself, uh, have, uh, always having had great expectations about possibilities of improvement of relations, more so because uh, I was personally involved in it, but I have now reached a conclusion that we should not expect mm. anything reasonable from India. And if they finally come to their senses and move forward, yes, we should reciprocate and we will, we will certainly win. So, concluding, I will say that as far as Pakistan is concerned, and I personally am concerned, the trajectory of Pakistan-India relations at the moment looks rather bleak and not much hope. Thank you. Senator Mushahid Hussain Sayyid for his remarks. Uh, Senator. <laughs> 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 Mr. Minister, 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 Mr. Minister,
I think this is a very distinguished audience of uh, generals and journalists and diplomats and scholars and students also. And it's my great privilege to be here uh, because in uh, Pakistan we have very little knowledge of basic facts when it comes to national security and foreign policy. And I'm glad that uh, uh, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood and uh, Ambassador Azaz have broken from this tradition of focusing on <laughs> contemporary history or current history because Balakot uh, strike is current history, three years old. What happened? We got uh, a detailed exposition of that from uh, Air Marshal uh, Farad Saab and also the uh, various facets of that. And in this regard, I would say that uh, uh, as a voracious book reader, I've been very happy to read one of the finest accounts by any diplomat. Uh, Memoir is, is uh, Azaz uh, Saab's uh, diplomatic footprints. Because it's not based on second-hand source or third-hand source or uh, reliable sources. It's a, a person who was there. It's not a, who was physically a participant in those events, who was a note-taker, who took minutes. So it's based factually. And, and the good thing is that uh, unlike many other Pakistanis, he does not have any agenda. It's a... a only agenda is to educate the reader through facts and of course he has his own analysis, his own perspective. So I think that it's a highly readable account and it's an educative account mm -hmm. and especially on India policy also which mm -hmm. I followed very closely. And I would say first of all I would compliment the Pakistan Armed Forces led by the Air Force which has always been a very professional service. We know what happened in 65 they used to say it was a triple A combination, Allah, artillery and air force, which uh, faced uh, and what M.M. Alam did and others. And I said the same in my, doc in my comments on the documentary on uh, M.M. Alam Saab, the national uh, hero. And of course, uh, one of my role models in good governance in Pakistan has always been when I lecture good governance is Air Marshal Noor Khan. That how one man can make a difference. You put him at the head of PIA, it turns around. You put him at the head of the cricket board, it turns around. You put him at the head of hockey, it turns around. So the difference of one, leadership, quality, caliber, that shows. And remember, he was the first one in 69 as Deputy Chief Marshal or Administrator to give a progressive labor and students policy when General Yaya Khan was the president in 69. So which is, because I went to Bangladesh and they still remember that. He was talking to the students. So this is, and in that context, I would say, uh, that uh, there were two elements of national security which were, in my view, Pakistan's finest hour. One was when we went nuclear. The way it was done, the way it was managed, uh, seamless coordination, civil, military, opposition, government, inter-service coordination, nation and the armed forces together, and we did the right thing at the right time. And I would say our response, Operation Swift retort to the Balakot aggression by India, was also in that the 21st century Pakistan's finest hour. How we managed it, how it was done, and it was done without bravado, without bragging. We did the thing, and then we said, we showed magnanimity, as Churchill said, in victory, and which was, uh, Abhinandan was released in, uh, within three days. Like Nachikita was released also in 1999 in Karakul, you remember, after six days. Uh, when the plane was shot down in May 1999. So it was in that tradition. And uh, when we talk of uh, issues, I think that uh, Dr. Abbasi talked about, Rizmana talked about uh, lessons also, and what role uh, we have to learn from that. I think that is extremely important. That it was the first aggression against Pakistan it's not LOC. Balakot is part of Pakistan. India launched an aggression. And I remember after that, when we uh, responded swiftly with the uh, downing of two planes and capturing the Indian pilot, I got a call from Western journalists. Now, Senator, what do you think? There will be a big war? I said, no, nothing will happen. He said, why not? How what will India do? I said, India is the bully on the block. If we blink, they will 
try to overrun us. Mm. But if we stand firm and we don't blink, they'll back off. And I said there'll be no war. They will swallow it because they know that we have the will, we have the capacity, and we have what we say in Urdu, the himmat to hit back. Come what may. And we will not take it like that. And that's what happened. And Modi accepted that, the bully on the block thing. But the uh, lessons are very important, and I think what was said by uh, General Saab and also uh, Ambassador Aziz Saab is very important. I think three important lessons uh, I would like to focus on that. And uh, one was alluded to by Ambassador Azaz in his opening remarks. The role of the so-called international community, the West. When annexation of Crimea takes place in 2014, all hell breaks loose. When annexation of Kashmir takes place in 2019, not a whimper, not a word of any kind. Annexation, illegal, militarily done by force, against the United Nations resolutions, the UN Charter, international law. And even uh, we saw the US endorsing the Indian uh, in, uh, attack on Pakistan, the State Department, the first statement which came. So I think that is very, very illustrative, that we should be very clear. And I think the role, uh, we should not expect the West or the US to play the role of what this one I've mentioned as a crisis manager. It's no longer there. The U.S. has taken very clear decisions. They lost badly in Afghanistan. They have smashed the Muslim world in 20 years. Six trillion dollars wasted. This is according to the Brown University study. One million Muslims slaughtered or killed. 324,000 bombs, drones and missiles rained on the Muslim countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Yemen. It's a long list based on what was called regime change. And please do not forget, I remember I was in Washington, somebody said, you have been having had a double-faced policy. I said, the most double-faced policy was yours, the US. He said, Give me an example. This is the US thing. I said, please read the book, Lawless World, published by Philip Sands, a British uh, barrister. He cites a conversation, because we talk about the history, and that should be recorded, on 30th January 2003, between President Bush and Prime Minister Blair, just before the Iraq War. The Iraq War is supposed to begin in 20th March 2003. And Bush is talking to Blair and Blair and British, like the good old tradition of the British maintaining the minutes. His secretary is taking notes and the minutes are being taken. And uh, Bush says that uh, we'll, we'll sort out uh, Iraq very soon and then after that we have to focus on fewer countries. And Bush, uh, Blair asks which countries? He says we have to focus on the nuclear activities and programs of four countries. <coughs> North Korea, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. While well, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are ostensibly allies in, I'm talking of 30th January 2003, the US already had designs on Pakistan's nuclear program as per this book. I'm quoting the source scriptures, I'm not quoting any Pakistani source. Lawless world says the very clearly. So this was, thank God for the resistance of the Iraqi people and the Muslim resistance. <laughs> that, you know, uh, uh, the Holy Quran says, wa makaru, wa makaru Allah, wa Allah wa khairul makareen. They planned and the Almighty planned. And verily, the Almighty is the best of the planners. So, all those plans which were made by the Pentagon warriors and gold warriors and others just crumbled in the face of what they did. And of course, we saw what happened in Afghanistan, which I think marks the beginning of the end of the American Empire, because after all that, <coughs> <laughs> they threw out the Taliban and then they handed back power to the Taliban <laughs> in a deal which they themselves signed in a leap year, 29th, so they, they don't have to have mark their anniversary for at least four years. <laughs> deliberately, I think it was done deliberately because it's such a humiliating 29th February 2020 because that will come after four years now. <laughs> See, like today's 20th February, tomorrow there will be a first March, there will be no 29th. So you see, you see this, $100 million spent 
and the whole world. General uh, uh, Asad Yasin Malik sir talked of the it's false okay. flag operation. I mean, you had a war in Iraq based on a lie. Based on a lie. And what was the lie? The weapons of mass destruction. And you're talking of the world's biggest democracy? Please read Tom Friedman. 8th of May, 2003, after the Iraq war. And what does he say about the world's biggest and greatest democracy? He says, and I quote, and this was also in Haaretz, in the Israeli newspaper and the New York Times. 25 men working in around five blocks, as Yadav Adal Sattab, you would know because you're a old Washingtonian like me. Working around the five blocks of the White House, generals, retired diplomats, uh, political pundits and journalists, and the newcoms, the Israeli lobby. If they had been exiled to an island, there would have been no Iraq. He is not talking of the US Congress. He is not talking of anybody. 25 people, he says, they were the ones who were the driving force of the Iraq. And now, the Afghanistan war, please see the Washington, uh, the Afghanistan papers published by the Washington uh, Post, November 2019. And please see the report of SIGAR, Special Inspector General on Afghanistan Reconstruction, S-I-G-A-R, 17th August 2021. It's all on the internet. The official strength of the Afghan National Army was 350,000. Actually, 50,000. Yeah. It was a ghost army. It was a ghost army, and the people were pocketing right and left. The Pentagon, the contractors, and this, uh, the clique they had created, the uh, Kabul regime they had created there. So, and these are the facts. So, the first thing is please do not have expectations that the West, the international community, the United States of America, they have taken very clear decisions. Their best friend in the region is India. The biggest enemies are Russia and China. So that's very clear. And you've already mentioned back, uh, the foundational agreements. Uh, it started uh, with uh, LEMOA, the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Association, 2016. From CASA, 2000, about communication, 2018. And then 2020, BECA, Basic Exchange Cooperation Agreement. When was it signed? 27th October 2020. And Esper and Pompeo flew from Washington one week before the American election to sign the agreement, which knits India as a strategic military and intelligence partner of the United States. So this is where the double standards number one of the West. Number two, I think the lessons you mentioned is India. India is going through the most profound transformation of its state and its society in the last 75 years. It's becoming a republic of Hindutva. Please read Aranduti Roy in the New York Times. And I quote, in today's India, RSS is the state and an architecture of fascism is being erected in India. Aranduti Roy and Indian Roy. And uh, I think somebody talked of genocide also. Please read. Dr. Gregory Stanton, Chairman of Genocide Watch, his interview with Karan Thapar and his testimony to the US Congress. Karan Thapar, we have read Bara, January 2022. And what does he say? Gregory Stanton, India has the makings of a genocide starting with Kashmir and Assam. This is an American saying, and this has been endorsed by the Holocaust Watch Memorial in Washington. It's a Jewish organization. They are saying that. So we should be very clear that what India is trying to do, India has strategic clarity towards Pakistan. They are very clear. They want to demonize Pakistan. They want to damage Pakistan. They want to destabilize Pakistan. They can go to that extent, which is the World Cup, India preferred to lose the World Cup in order that we don't come in. It's never happened before in international sports that they will go to that extent. 
सो उनसे खैर की तबक कर रखा है इंडिया नाउ अंडर मोदी हैज एन आइडियोलॉजिकल फॉर पॉलिसी मुस्लिम पैशन एट होम पाकिस्तान पैशन दे आर इन एक्सट्रिकली इंटरटेन एंड आई थिंक आई वुड टोटली एग्री विद एम्बेस्टर अजीज साहब वॉट नॉन सेंस आई हेयर सम पंजाबी इंडस्ट्रियलिस्ट इन लाहौर टॉकिंग ऑफ ट्रेड एंड हाथ मल रहे हैं कि जी होगा का खुलेगा वॉट नॉन सेंस अखंड भारत की बात कर रहे हैं वो कह रहे हैं कि ये क्या किया था कायद आजम मोहम्मद अली जिना ने ये तो बड़ा जुल्म किया था भारत माता को अपने काटा था ये टॉक एंड यूर से लेट्स हैव ट्रेड यू कांट आई एम सॉरी यू कांट से वुमन इज हाफ प्रेगनेंट पार्ट ऑफ माई सेंग सो कांट कंपार्टमेंटलाइज दैट पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया इज वो तो ठीक है जी ट्रेड हम कर लेंगे और बाकी वो रॉ जो मर्जी करें डिस्टेबलाइज भी करें डिमोनाइज भी करें डिस लैब भी हो नो we should have strategic clarity on india that includes the pakistani establishment that includes the pakistani government that includes the pakistani parliament that includes the pakistani people we should be very very clear and we should thank the great leader qaid e azam mohammad ali jinnah for his vision that he saw through this hindutva mindset 90 years ago that we cannot coexist with these kind of mindset and we are today mashallah the free citizens of a free country thanks to the qaidas so we should be very clear this is not on you get us message in the back channel that india is willing to talk on kashmir and there are briefings given we become their spokesman we india doesn't say a word and we are briefing people yes india is willing to talk on kashmir india will do this india will do this you don't have to go it's no rocket science ask as our saab ask as he saab ask khale saab those who have dealt with india who have, uh, either as diplomats or who live there they know exactly yes you want to live in peace with our neighbors based on reciprocity and based on equality and i think that is very important so in this strategic clarity i think that we have to be very focused and the world around us is changing i feel that pakistan has taken the right decision our strategic partnership with china and our strategic outreach to russia <coughs> we have got by the grace of god strategic space today the west is in decline i've just come back from washington and uh, the uk after the afghanistan i've never seen the us in this kind of state the us is today a declining superpower it's not the kind of uh, america <coughs> civilized that which was 20 years ago and thank god for that they have done enough damage to our part of the world and i think the time has come for regional hands to decide the destiny of this region whether it's china russia pakistan iran turkey uh, the central asian republics or saudi arabia or qatar whatever the countries are i think we should rise to the occasion help afghanistan especially in the humanitarian disaster which is impending there and also uh, we should be very clear that we are not going to be part of this kind of block politics or being pressured today they say uh, putin is the devil incarnate i was talking somebody asked me what do you think this invasion and what oh, this has happened i said when 20th march i cannot forget 2003 when iraq was bombed the cnn reported what a beautifully lit up sky over baghdad mm -hmm. this was the reporting being done nobody talked to the poor <laughs> iraqis all right even said half a million children being killed because of died because of sanctions it was well worth the price this is so <laughs> with the talk of ukrainians and others i think this is hypocrisy these are double standards which we reject they try to demonize xi jinping he had the most successful <laughs> olympics in history and the best friends of america in the region cc egypt khani of qatar Uh, Mohammed bin Zayed of UAE and Mohammed bin Salman they were all in Beijing <laughs> attending the Olympics they know which way the wind is blowing Allama Akbar had mentioned dekh mashriq se ubarte hue suraj ko dekh see the sun rising in the east that is what is happening the world is being transformed this is one in a century changes which we have after world war 1 when ottoman empire collapsed the region the world changed lines were drawn by sikes and pico the french and the uh, new states and british new states came into being and you saw jordan and iraq and palestine and saudi arabia and all the, the transformation after world war 2 you had the collapse of the british empire 
and the beginning of the American century, the American century, ladies and gentlemen, thankfully, is now coming to an end. And I think we should now be ready to be masters of our own destiny. Let regional hands decide the future of this region. And let us play our historical role, which is there, not looking over our shoulders what will happen in London, Washington, or Brussels. And building a better tomorrow. And in this spirit, I welcome the initiative of the Institute of Strategic Studies. And uh, I would say that uh, I would also suggest Khalisa, uh, a seminar based on uh, diplomatic footprints, that take some chapters of that on foreign policy uh, issues which were there, Pakistan-US relations, Pakistan-India relations, Pakistan-China, Pakistan-Russia, segment as a practitioner's approach, not a theoretical or academic approach. I think we all want, we should learn uh, about facts and about history. And finally, I'd like to say, Josie Sabnika, the most important thing in international relations is keeping commitments, not reneging. The US and India have a history of reneging on those commitments. <coughs> the Ukraine crisis, the roots of it lie in February 1990. James Baker met Gorbachev and they were talking of German unification. And it was, I think, 11th of February 1990. And James Baker said, Mr. President, NATO will not expand one inch eastwards, quote unquote. One inch eastward. Only thing was it was not in writing, but was. And what happened? Poland, Hungary, Romania. And now they say Ukraine wants to be, we should be part of that. People accuse us of having this Afghanistan thing. Of course, every country wants the neighborhood to be friendly towards them. So Ukraine, now Ukraine has said yesterday, yes, we can talk about a new trend. Wali Khan I used to know, interview Wali Khan, and he said, what is the thing? And the whole root of the crisis is what Kashmir ki apne baat ki. It's a narrow reneging on his commitment. And you have baat ki 1989. Ki. Let me draw your attention to what happened after that. I was in the talks with uh, Manmohan Singh Sa, in, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, Sheet Kusuri and along with our ambassador. Can I mean, I tell you, ambassador, you and me. Muni Rakram Sa. We were there and uh, he was with uh, Narayanan and Nafar Singh. Sorry, Bathway. He backed out. He wouldn't even come to Pakistan. And Shyam Saran Sa, the Foreign Secretary of India, has been very honest. How India views the world. Please read that. He says the agreement was reached on low-hanging fruit, Siachin and Sarkari. So meeting we the Indian establishment. There is some other establishment. Now establishment we talk about what we have done. What is the establishment? He said to General J.J. Singh, your friends who are here, and Narayan, how can we trust Pakistan? We will not do that. They backed up. And this is, I think, in 2006. Indian they quote here. Quote, I'm, I'm not quoting Pakistanis. I'm not quoting Azhar Sahib. I'm quoting the Indian folks. How India views the world. Shyam Saran Kitapar. So this is the fact. So I think uh, we, are, we are on the right side of history. The world is opening up. There are two trends. One is connectivity and cooperation. The other is conflict and confrontation. The US military industrial complex wants a new Cold War in search of enemies so they can have bloated profits. And while the region is opening up, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative, we welcome American investment, European investment. Now they have a copycat program in America. B3W, bring back better world infrastructure. European is what? Golden Gateway. That's a good thing. I addressed the European Union ambassadors the other day. I said, most welcome. We welcome anybody who comes there. Please come and invest at least. Don't try to demonize anybody else. So that is the future. And I think that Pakistan, uh, is on the right track on these issues. We have strategic space, we have a breather, and uh, Modi for the first time is on the defensive. I've never seen such criticism of India in the Western press as I've seen it. Intolerant India, economist, <coughs> divider in chief, Time magazine, other Guardian, other papers. So I think uh, the Western governments are hypocritical, but I think Western public opinion <coughs> still has a conscience. And I think we should tap into that conscience. Zasa was a very successful ambassador in Washington, D.C. I've been a student in Washington, D.C. at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. I think so. We need to 
uh, pull up a socks and uh, instead of uh, talking of conspiracy theories or rona dhona ke ye mare gaye haath malte rahe we should uh, be on the front foot and take it forward mm -hmm. and i think that we have a strong case which we should present with facts logic and wisdom without losing a cool or a face kare it's all about interest and the us needs pakistan more than we need the us at as of now and because of our location because of our so inshallah we can build up a better future through strong foreign policy and uh, a clarity strategic clarity on national security and other issues thank you so much thank and you. it's been a pleasure and delight and uh, i want to thank the institute of strategic studies for being a genuine think tank normally we had more tanks than thinking but now the <laughs> balance has been changed by the current lot thank you very much